of the Crown Princess of Thailand who's put a lot of money into this, this organization called I Create. They're working on doing things like, for instance, creating a cultural heritage friendly without barriers tourism campaign to try to say, you can go anywhere from one element, uh, one side of Southeast Asia all the way through the other in your experience as a tourist if you require assistive technology should not change. Huge incentive, lots of money being thrown into that will be spread throughout Southeast Asia. There's real debate at the conferences, and they have these conferences every year now, between whether we, you should be supplying assistive technology versus access to information technology. What's the most important thing to do? Bring people to a computer and have them have full access versus other forms of assistive technology. Again, in low resource environments, you often have to choose between the two. So if you're thinking, why not have both? It's not always possible. Within Cambodia itself, I mean, these are all just examples of organizations. The thing in Cambodia to keep in mind is that you have some organizations, such as the Government Ministry of Monsalabi and the Disability Action Council, that are government bodies versus all these other NGOs that are working on things such as wheelchair provision. Sure, uh, just in January 2010, Cambodia has now its first autism awareness campaign. It's the first time anybody's actually tried this. But as you can see, even from the first entry with Mosul, this is the government industry in which all assistive technology is embedded. Look at its mandate. <laughs> its mandate is hopelessly confused. It's the Ministry of Social Affairs, Veterans, and Youth Rehabilitation. And also, believe it or not, within that, it also deals with sports. <laughs> so we want to introduce assistive technology into the Disability Action Council you are competing with someone who may say, yeah, but what about the World Cup? <laughs> that will bring more political mileage to Cambodia. That's what we're competing with. Uh, it's a huge, it's, it's a horribly confused mandate, and that's why there's so many NGOs working on these things. Okay, very briefly, I'm going to go over two examples. Uh, one is kind of low, sort of low tech, but certainly low cost in comparison to the other one, which is the, the prosthetic limb campaign in Cambodia, and the second one, there's some information out there from the company that does this, is the Braille Translation Software. So briefly go over them, and we'll stop and have time for some discussion. One of the chief groups that works on this, it's one of those groups that got its name back when words like this weren't problematic, and they've kept the name Handicap International, which is actually an NGO organization based in Belgium, does a lot of good uh, and important work in Cambodia. What they do is they engage in what's rural community outreach. They go into some of the provinces where there's huge amounts of landmines, there's large amounts of unexploded ordnance, and they actually go out and they seek and recruit people who are interested in getting prosthetic limbs of one sort or other, and they bring them to the facility in Siem Reap, and I'll, and I'll show you a picture of them in just a second, and they go through the whole process of not, of not just outfitting them and saying, look, what kinds of work do you want to do? But more importantly, they take them back to the village and in the entire village, they end up socially integrating them. Other linkage effects, which are very important in this industry, they're trying to manufacture all the limbs in a manufacturing facility in the capital city. Cambodia now has the School of Prosthetics and Orthotics, which is uh, set up and run by the Cambodian Trust, where they actually design new assistive technology, improve the quality of prosthetic limbs, so you have persons who are going through the process of social integration, a school that's training people to make them better and better, and you're also saying let's manufacture them locally, right? providing potentially very powerful linkage effects. In terms of what the goal is, the idea is to get rid of this idea that it's useless, and the idea of making productive members of society, to erase the idea that there's a separation. Uh, most of these prosthetic limbs, prosthetic limbs that are being um, devised are work appropriate, the idea is what kind of work do you do for women? They will, for instance, have interchangeable hands. One of them will be a knife for the kitchen. You can chop, you can cook. For men, it might be something to do agricultural work. It might be a hammer. Uh, they're actually doing now very some specialized handicraft work and having all sorts of tools out there so you can simply interchange a hand, for instance, uh, with you know, a prosthetic hand with a number of different instruments. It might seem somewhat crude, but it's very, very helpful in getting people to say, look, I'm not Bicot, I can do anything you can do. This is a museum. So that's what's going, let me show you a picture of. This is the facility of Handicap International. This is actually the one in CMDF. 
there's an on-site dormitory, there's an on-site, um, if, you, if you are chosen, if you want to get one of these specially fitted prosthetic limbs, they will, they will bring you here, they will outfit you specifically, they will, you can stay here for free, you eat for free, you are here for as long as it takes, till you get used to it, and then they will take you back in their Lexus <laughs> SUV, <laughs> back to the village. And they will simply explain to everybody what has happened, and they will make sure they go through the entire process. A very thorough social integration and medical process. It's actually quite impressive that they do this, but they have funds to do so. The second example is the Braille software. This is very impressive. It's high tech and it's very expensive to a certain extent. But again, this is also done by a company, Duxbury Systems, that will do it for free. If someone approaches them, they will not ask the question of, can you pay? They will simply do it and find the money somehow. Here's a picture. Of, this is uh, the example I'm giving now starts with the Crusoe My School. I'll show you a picture of the school in just a second. It's also in the city of Zambia. Uh, this school is not only involved with the Braille software translation kit, uh, they're also developing a Cambodia Khmer-based sign language. That's a page from the book they're developing. This is how the software works. It's interesting that the new release right now works in about 60 to 70 languages. The new release, which is coming out this summer, has increased this to 130 languages. They can now translate from script into Braille software and also printing. 130 languages. What is interesting is that nobody at Duxbury Systems knows these languages. It's all Unicode. It's all mathematical algorithms that go simply, we get the alphabet. If the Unicode exists for the script, they can transform it into Braille. It's difficult to do, but they'll do it. Uh, and it's been hugely meaningful. Here's a picture of the school, because this school, which is probably the premier school for deaf and blind children, not only now can have its students go on to college, because they'll take any textbook and translate it into Braille. But what's interesting about this school is they believe in this immersion package. They take students off-site once a week. They take all their students off-site to all of the other schools in the area. And once a week, they invite teachers and students from those schools to spend a day here. The idea is this should not be that school. But it's just a school like any other school. There's just different kinds of technology to make sure everyone has the same knowledge base. Very, very effective program. First of its kind in Cambodia. This is also where they, the, the Duxbury system developed the Braille software. Lastly, any text, as I said, if you have a text, they'll find a way to turn it into a Braille text for you. If you have a class in accounting, they'll find a way to translate. The texts are printed using a Braille press that's there. These books have been kept. There's now a Braille library in Badenbaum. They're raising money so that anybody who gets into college can have access to any textbook they want. The costs are higher, but Duxbury Systems and other NGOs will cover them. They now even have a very, very uh, durable Braille typewriter, so you can write your own papers as well. This is actually low tech. This thing weighs about 10 pounds, and I think it would survive uh, probably a bomb blast. It's unbelievably durable, and that was the whole point. It doesn't have to be plugged in. It's manual, and you can, get, you can do everything you need to do to do well, for instance, in advanced studies. Two more pictures. There's this one. Uh, there's a real danger in Cambodia, by the way, of exploitation. If you don't have this idea of giving people um, the chance to pursue higher education, one of the things that the, the darker sides in Cambodian society is those who are left in the margins are often open for exploitation, trafficking, and all sorts of things. And one of the things they're trying to do in the tourist industry, even in Krusar Khmer, is to say, look, even if you're not going to go on to college, there are other skills you can have to make sure that you simply don't fall through the cracks of the system and fall prey to exploitation. The one last thing I want to say, because I'm a little bit over time already, you can see, you can probably read the bullet points here, but the one last thing I do want to say is this. Um, in spite of all the good work that many of these NGOs do to bring this technology into Cambodia, I think it's a great thing, it's actually quite controversial in Cambodia. Because Cambodia and other people, even NGO activists in Cambodia, are very worried about the extent to which Cambodia has become reliant upon outside, outside funding. In the political science world, we like to speak in terms of democratic maturity, that even though you have good and you know, well-intentioned people showing you in Cambodia, that if there's excessive reliance on NGOs, the government itself is not held accountable 
for a lack of service provision. And in the long 